did you get um, a link uh, with my newsletter? Article? Yes. yes, I did. Okay, cool. Thank you. I now have everyone's article except for Patty, who isn't supposed to get it to me till uh, next week, anyways. And but well, I don't. Yeah, she she. Did you hear from her? Um, I haven't. Uh, I heard that she's not going to be here, but I haven't heard from her regarding um, uh, whether or not she'll still be able to complete her article. So Robert and team, um, I hope you got an agenda. We, we do have a few items that, uh, to go through first before we get to your great presentation. I uh, just wanted to let you know. Thank you. We did. We did see the agenda. Yes, we did. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. And we are live to YouTube. Um, I'm going to start the recording. You can technically start the meeting at 530 if you'd like. We will establish quorum, but um, if you want to wait just a minute for um, Carol and Kelly to get here. It's up to you, Tracy. Like frantically looking at my desk for like a good cultural landscape-esque gavel and really oh. falling short. So. I like your dinosaur above you. <laughs> it's green. Yes. That unfortunately is uh, like a filled with air. So it will be a poor gavel if I try to make noise with it, but. <laughs> There's Carol. Can, okay, all right, I'll wait for him to get settled in. Posted note. I have lots of those, I guess. <laughs> That's an accident until discovery if there ever was one. Oh yeah, like the glue or something or they were trying to do something else and they came upon that accidentally at 3 a.m. Oh. As a child of the 90s, uh, Romy and Michelle's high school reunion is the first thing I think of when I think of post-it notes, <laughs> pretending to think of the glue. But, awesome. Well, I think uh, we will get started. Um, so I will now call to order the June 17th meeting of the Salem Historic Landmark Commission. Will the recorder please take roll call? Uh, Commissioner Cunningham? Here. Commissioner Kurtiman? Here. Commissioner French? Present. Commissioner Fuller, absent excuse. Um, Commissioner Ponce? Here. Uh, Commissioner Mulvihill, absent excuse. Commissioner Schwartz? Here. Commissioner Thomas, currently absent. Uh, and Commissioner Zimmerman? Here. Uh, we have established quorum. And if Commissioner Thomas shows up, I'll note that in the minutes at the time. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. Uh, so the commission will now hear testimony from the public concerning items not on the agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak at this time? Um, I do not believe, I believe everyone who's not part of the commission is here for a specific item um, and was invited, but if any of them had anything, this would be the time to speak. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, hearing none, we will now consider approval of the minutes from the May 20th meeting. Um, are there any corrections of note? Uh, I saw one. Commissioner on, on page three for the uh, photo contest for uh, B and uh, historic exterior, we have a motion by Commissioner Cunningham, but we don't have a seconded by anyone. It just says commissioner. I will go through and add that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. And I had a question on page two under the Ben Maxwell Award. I see that we uh, approved the amendment. Um, do we need a separate thing approving the actual award? Um, if it's not there, I will clarify it and, um, and make sure that we have, because I know you voted for it. So it might just not be reflected well in the minutes. 
Um, yeah, no, I know we did it kind of weird because we had the motion to just give it to one and then we had the amendment for two. And then I thought we had the vote on two, like after the vote on the amendment. That's probably not making sense, but. Yeah, um, so I, I can go in and um, clarify that. Um, I just as a note for the commission, I broke my arm a couple weeks ago, and that has been. Um, I found I'm making more errors with only typing with my left hand and using a mouse with my left hand. It's very exciting. I'm I'm a right-handed person, so um, I will go in and. <laughs> Um, he's the only support staff right now. I just want to say, Zach, you're doing a great job. Yeah. I, know I, will, I will go in and make those um, corrections. <clears throat> they are beautiful one-armed minutes. <laughs> we love them. So are there any other uh, corrections of note? Perfect. All right, wait, may I please have a motion to approve the minutes with those corrections and clarifications? I still move. I'll Is there... Perfect. So Commissioner Zimmerman moved and Commissioner Cottingham seconded to approve the motion or no, approve the minutes. Sorry. Are there, do, 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 I messed up my thing, my order. Sorry, guys. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Awesome. The beautiful minutes uh, that Zach typed with one hand are approved and we, we thank you, Zach, for your help. Uh, so with that, we have no public hearings tonight, uh, so we will move into action items. Uh, the first thing to discuss is mitigation for the Hillcrest project uh, by Department of Administrative Services. Kimberly. Great. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kimberly Fitzgerald, the Historic Preservation Officer for the City of Salem. So um, some of you have been through this before, but for those of you that are newer to the commission and have not, I'm gonna kind of go over why, we're, why you're even looking at this. So uh, Oregon Revised Statute ORS 358-653 requires that DAS consult with the SHPO, Oregon State Historic Preservation Office to consider the effects of the sale of this property, of any property um, that's held publicly to a private um, property owner. And, and what they're supposed to do is review and consider the effects on the historic resources within the AP, the, the, the area, that the lot that in this case is being sold. And, and then they make a determination about whether or not this sale, which they call an undertaking, ha will have an adverse effect um, on the, the resource. And if the answer to that question is yes, then mitigation is required for that adverse effect. And <clears throat> so I'll go through uh, what our, our code also addresses this as well. But just to be clear, we are not a regulatory authority in this case, so it's not a public hearing. You're not required to make a decision on anything, but um, because Salem is a certified local government, uh, we are a stakeholder, meaning um, the SHPO and DAS have invited us, uh, the Landmarks Commission, you to take a look at what they're proposing for mitigation and offer any input or comments. So in this particular case, um, I'll talk through what the actual resource is. Here, so this is Hillcrest. It's located, oops, I'm at two four five zero Strong Road Southeast, kind of um, in the Fairview-ish area. Um, it was also known as the Oregon State Institute for the Feeble-Minded, and the Hillcrest Youth Correctional Facility was uh, established in 1913. I think construction was completed in 1914. They have a, a wide range of buildings on the site. Um, they determined 18 are eligible and the period of significance is from 1914 to 1970. Um, and the, the um, SHPO concurs that it is eligible for the National Register and that the sale is an adverse effect. So, so here we are discussing the mitigation. So I wanna talk a little bit about the what our code says about it. So in SRC 230.082, um, it does describe um, uh, public historic mitigation and it defines adverse effect. 
So we're in a, a kind of an unusual situation here where we do not define an action um, relating to the sale of a property. But what, what I would recommend is that you look at this like um, demo, demolition because once it passes into private hands, the, the we no longer there is no obligation under our code for any review of any alterations and there would be a, no future requirement on the private property owner so so th that's how I, I would look at it that it would be a consider the equivalent of a level three adverse effect because the property owner would be free to redevelop as um, they would like to because it's not designated uh, so what um, what that level three adverse effect, what the recommended mitigation is in our code. I've listed, you can see it here on your screen. Uh, it includes building documentation, which is ILS level survey, which is part of what uh, DAS is proposing here, which is an, a higher level actually, the um, building documentation, the HABs level. Uh, and they are also proposing to do some oral history development, which is pretty cool and um, an encyclo Oregon Encyclopedia entry and also an entry for the Oregon Heritage blog and then to pass along some information about what's required for archeological compliance. So the, the additional items in our code is that uh, we recommend that uh, on-site interpretation be developed and that also some uh, funding be donated to our Historic Preservation Trust Fund, which is what we use for our toolbox grant and other, other things, but primarily the toolbox grant. Uh, and also I just wanted to point out that it is located in our cultural resource protection zone, which is our high probability archeological zone. So in addition to um, just information about archeology, span I, I just would, would recommend that uh, a little bit more be added to the mitigation that uh, if the private property owner chooses to do redevelopment that includes ground disturbing activity that um, a testing and monitoring plan be developed in consultation with the SHPO. So, but that said, as I mentioned before, your alternatives are you don't have to do anything at all. Um, you're not required to. But, but you can um, offer a letter of support for the mitigation they propose, maybe add some comments, maybe some additional recommendations for DAS and SHPO to consider as they're developing that MOA memorandum of agreement, or you can uh, direct staff to write a letter of opposition with comments that we can then forward to SHPO. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so you guys can see each other uh, unless there's any other questions or anything you wanna see from what I shared. Okay, I will stop. And Thank that you. concludes my, my portion of sharing. And I, I'm not sure as, if Darren's here from DAS. Kimberly, I, I had one thing I wanted to, to share with the, the group there that potential conflict there for me. Um, oh, right, um, it's not a formal um, yeah. public hearing, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, I was uh, sorry to just cut you off, Commissioner Ponce. Um, yeah, I would. I recognize we're not making an official decision, but I would like uh, anyone to be able to express a conflict of interest or ex parte contact for this. Uh, Commissioner Ponce, I'll start with you. Yes, so uh, I just believe that there's a potential for conflict there, so I'll, I'll stay. Uh, we could use from this one the comments. Awesome. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Is there anyone else that would like to just get something on the record? Commissioner French? I, uh, not a conflict of interest myself, but um, the SHPO office, of course, many of you know, I work for the SHPO office. And um, though I'm not participating in consultation on this undertaking um, for their office. So I have knowledge of the project barely and that I knew it was happening, but um, I haven't reviewed it and I can make a unbiased decision today. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I would also like to just uh, state that in my past life, I also worked at the State Historic Preservation Office and uh, believe I sent some emails uh, back and forth with Darren about this project. Um, did, did not ever work on the, the draft mitigation, uh, may have had a meeting with him about a uh, path forward uh, on how to consult. Um, I also believe I can be impartial um, and, and comment on this. So just wanna get that on the record, but great. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, Darren, would you like to, to add anything uh, before we uh, 
make a decision? I don't think there's much to add. We've been working with SHPO and working with the tribes to really kind of flesh out what's meaningful and what makes sense. Uh, we do know that the, the new owner will be developing it for a private uh, residential care facility, so uh, it will not be open to the public. Uh, they have indicated that they intend to remove the two modular buildings, which were built in the late 80s, early 90s, early double wides. Uh, and, uh, the administration building, they're particularly keen on keeping, which is the oldest remaining building on campus that dates to 1925. Uh, the remaining buildings are primarily from the 1940s and 50s, and they are currently exploring which ones are of are good for them to use for their purposes. So they're working with architects to, to figure that out. Awesome. Thank you for that additional information. Um, is there any discussion, questions, comments, a motion? I, I will open it up. Commissioner Kurdeman? Uh, is this facility currently open to the public? No, the facility has, to my knowledge, never been open to the public. Um, and it's years as a youth correctional facility, it was a closed campus uh, secure facility. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I see Commissioner French has her hand up. Yeah. Um... Thank you for the recommendations, Kimberly. I really, I absolutely agree, especially with the archaeology testing plan. Um, I think, um, I think back to the north campus of the mental hospital where we, there was a lot of stuff around the buildings, but then we also found there's all these archaeology things associated with the long history of the site being in use. And so I think you're absolutely correct that a long-term um, testing and monitoring plan is needed for this this space. Um, I would recommend perhaps GPR to start off with to see if we can identify some of those pit features or things like that before we start trying to um, put in 20 meter holes over 60 acres or so, or however big it is. Um, I also um, wasn't sure if, I mean, Darren talked a little bit about stuff, some stuff that they're planning to remove and things like that, but I was wondering if there's any way to to recommend um, consultation with them and Willamette Heritage Center to see if there's any um, extent things that they would like to take at the museum, things that might be removed um, when the new tenants move in. Obviously not like hard building features or things like that, but I know when they did the South Salem High School, they took like lockers and things like that. So if there's any kind of items um, that would be pertinent to Salem's history that they could use as a display, that would be, um, I would recommend that. Awesome, thank you, Commissioner French. Any other comments from any commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Zimmerman. This is kind of a question for Kimberly, but how often do we have situations like this where um, uh, an op there's an option where folks uh, have projects where they don't uh, provide a donation of the Historic Preservation Trust Fund and don't uh, have an interest in also having an uh, on-site uh, resource of historic materials. Is that kind of common or is this kind of more of a rare situation? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think Jamie, Commissioner French mentioned the, the North Campus. In that particular situation, that was a little different. And I think Darren was involved in that one as well. And I, I do believe that part of the mitigation for that uh, funds were set aside, but uh, for the uh, museum and to develop um, an exhibit, a traveling exhibit. Is that right, Darren? <laughs> Help me. Um, so that, so that, that, that piece in terms of uh, ensuring that education and outreach and site uh, interpretation, uh, because the museum is right there, was, was adequately addressed. Um, honestly, uh, the funding uh, for our Historic Preservation Trust Fund uh, the most we've ever received was from actually a private donor, and that was um, to help restore the, uh, the, the train depot there um, at the Amtrak uh, rail station, which is how it all started. So, and, and then that donor keeps um, providing funding for the residential toolbox uh, grant program. So, so at the time that this particular section of code was written, which was 
um, not long after we started our toolbox grant program. Um, so this was in 2013. The, the intention was to provide a, a really pragmatic um, way for property owners, um, primarily pro uh, because it's for public mitigation for, for property owners, the state essentially to um, easily in theory, mitigate for adverse effect like this in a way that then um, can empower the local jurisdiction to do um, education and outreach if needed or pass along um, uh, funds to other historic property owners. So, so that was the intention behind that recommendation back when that code was written, but no, it's not super common. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. Are there any other comments Commissioner Kurtiman. Um, I can see how the, the on-site um, mitigation materials would be a little tricky in this situation as far as, you know, who exactly is going to be having access to the on-site materials and is that really the intended audience? Um, and then also the story that would be told through those mitigation, through those on-site materials. Um, is that a story that the, the actual viewers are going to feel comfortable seeing? And is it the place to have an uncomfortable conversation about history? So anyways, I just wanted to bring that up as kind of my internal thoughts on what on-site materials might look like in this particular um, location in this particular case. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Kurdeman. Are there additional comments, thoughts? So I, I guess I would say, um, I actually think the mitigation provided is, is really nice. Um, I um, am maybe not the biggest fan of our code and the mitigation ideas. I totally understand why we have it. And I think it probably does help in many ways, but, um, uh, you know, I do believe in the consultation process and I like to think that, you know, each project is a little different and the mitigation should should be tailored to the resource in some ways. Um, so I actually did really like this mitigation. I think the photographic documentation is important. And then I appreciated kind of the, the wide variety of public options that would be out there. You can watch a video, you can read on Oregon Encyclopedia. I know I've stumbled on a lot of things on Oregon Encyclopedia that I would never have known about. Um, if they didn't have an article there. And I really loved the oral history component of that. I thought that was really creative um, and, and just so important. We can capture those histories one time and then they, they do go away forever. And so I, I love, I really love that component. And I like what Commissioner French said also about, you know, potentially adding some, some salvage depending on maybe what they choose to do with the buildings. I recognize that might be hard since that's unknown. It sounds like they know they're going to get rid of buildings outside of the period of significance. We don't need to um, capture anything from those buildings, but, you know, as, as the conversations continue, uh, and that would just be me, my thoughts on this. Um, it, I guess at this point I would ask, you know, are we fine just making no comment? Uh, Darren, I saw him taking notes uh, and, and figuring this out and Chip Oak and maybe Jason's on YouTube right now. He can watch the recording, um, but I really hope he's not. Um, and, or do we want to um, offer a letter of support or opposition or clarification to the mitigation? I guess that's our choice right now. And hearing nothing, oh, sorry, Commissioner French. I'll go ahead and move that we write a letter um, of comment with our um, additional thoughts, both Kimberly's and what was said here today um, regarding potential additional mitigation um, that we think is appropriate. Awesome, is there a second? I second. Okay, Commissioner French moved and Commissioner Kurdeman seconded that we write a letter uh, with the comments provided today. Uh, Commissioner French to your motion and would it be possible as you speak to your motion to maybe highlight the comments that you would like noted? Sure. I think we were kind of, we had a variety, so. Sure, uh, and my reasoning behind neither um, supporting or um, going against it is that um, quite honestly, like I, I hate to see these kinds of things 
torn down. We're seeing more and more throughout Salem as we continue to develop. And so I don't like to support mitigation, but it is important too that this is going to happen no matter what. We don't have a lot of say in that. And so um, us providing additional comments about what we think is appropriate um, while neither supporting or or denying that the process is going to continue um, is kind of was kind of my thinking on that. And those items that I was saying that should be added were the archaeology testing, um, the monetary contribution to the toolbox grant program, and um, I would and some kind of um, potential salvage either of um, features that will be removed or of movable um, items that were affiliated with the correctional institution. Um, that could be moved before it is sold, um, be negotiated with the Willamette Heritage Center or some other appropriate entity in the city. Thank you, Commissioner French. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay, Commissioner Cottingham. Um, yeah, I have a <clears throat> question. I think for Kimberly, um, I was gonna ask before the motion, but it works now too, which is uh, what is the timeline as far as our letter or commenting? Um, so I, I want to get it within the next 30 days because I know they're trying to finalize the MOA. I think, um, is, is, there, is there something you wanted to wait on? No, <laughs> no, no, I was just curious how, how quickly we need to get it done. So that's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cottingham. Is there any other discussion on the motion to write a letter uh, just outlining our additional comments? Commissioner Zimmerman. Yeah, the I guess guess for me, uh, it was kind of mentioned earlier that the building, the oldest one, the 1925 building, is kind of in the plans to be uh, preserved or reworked by the the new owners. I'd like to see in the in the letter, um, you know, something along the lines of if that building does get demolished or if the plans kind of change, that you know, kind of maybe put a bug in the folks' ear about maybe having something on site. Then, if that's the if the most historic building on the property is removed, maybe consider putting some sort of, a, you know, encouraging some sort of on-site, uh, um, you know, signage or something about the history of that property. Because I think, as folks have mentioned earlier, if it's a building that was built in the 50s or the 40s or one of the modular buildings from the 90s, not a lot of things tie that building to the site. But, you know, one of the, if it's the, the older buildings, the 1925 building, I think that has a little bit more, you know, cachet, a little more prominence than if the site loses that property. So maybe if we just put in the, the, the letter, um, should they consider, you know, removing the, the older buildings on the property, you know, maybe give some thought to, you know, putting, you know, something on the site that would remember, uh, memorialize those, those buildings of some sort. I know, granted, we can't really have any teeth in it, but it'd be nice just to, you know, put that out there in case plans do change and they decide to demolish that older building. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. Are there any additional comments on the, the motion with that friendly amendment? Uh, Commissioner Kurtiman. I think, you know, I, I know I had mentioned not, you know, or that on-site mitigation might be tricky, but, um, uh, re thinking about what Commissioner Zimmerman was saying, you, you could probably make that on-site interpretation um, be a bit more visible to guests maybe, like maybe it's in a, a garden space that has paths for walking or, or something like that that would encourage people to, people um, on the property, um, certified to be on the property <laughs> or, or, you know, or checked in guests sort of thing. Um, and uh, and residents to to go and explore and want to you know and, and have the opportunity to look at that. So you you know I think it could be done in a in a um, welcoming way. Uh, so I, I'm, I guess I'm just saying that just so it doesn't seem like I'm completely poo pooing on on site mitigation. <laughs> uh, but as far as the motion, uh, you know, Commissioner French made a good point on. Providing comment makes it look like we're not in support, but also not against. And that is true to some extent, you know, I mean, providing comment is also that we are recognizing the process. 
and saying, you know, yes, there is a process in place, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily get to fully write off everything and get to do everything and get away with it. Not to say this project is trying to do that. I definitely appreciate a lot of the mitigation measures that have already been proposed, and it's it's nice to see that. Um, I've definitely been on projects where mitigation measures were not so much proposed, and it's uh, it's a little depressing. So this was this was nice to see. So thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? All right, um, I, I guess I would just add, uh, you know, I'm gonna vote in favor of, of sending this letter. Um, I will say, I just wanna go on the record, I actually don't think the monetary uh, support is necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily feel, feel comfortable with that. I do understand um, all the discussions made, but I do appreciate that a little bit more is being made towards public outreach um, and mitigation kind of more directly associated with the resource being impacted. I am a firm believer in offsite mitigation and that you don't have to be totally connected. Um, but I, I do think that 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 fund, unless we could try to get that towards certain goals related to the property, um, I, I'm not 100% comfortable with that, but, but totally understand the, the opinion of the commission. Um, I would also just add, you know, Commissioner Zimmerman, I think you made an important point, right? That once this does, you know, go, once DAS transfers this property, um, you know, that, that we can make recommendations. I would, would say though that we have a responsibility as the Landmark Commission to identify properties like this and try to seek local or national designation for them. And so perhaps um, that's something that we need to talk about um, and do. Um, you know, obviously we would need owner consent, but perhaps we could work with the new property owner to to figure out what that looks like. Maybe we could even try to utilize, you know, historic tax credits as a way to get the property listed. Um, even if it's just that kind of one building, I'm, I'm really, really unfamiliar with the property, but I think we need to, to always be looking for ways to designate, you know, these historic places. Um, Cause we do have, you know, some, some ability to try our best to, to make sure they're preserved. Uh, is there any other discussion? All right, uh, hearing none, we will now vote on the recommendation to write a letter with our comments, neither supporting or opposing uh, the mitigation, but adding clarification that we'd like to see uh, more enhanced archaeology testing, monetary support, and salvage uh, and potential on site mitigation if the property, if the main building was to be demolished. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. And Commissioner Ponce did not vote, <laughs> so, but we knew he wasn't going to, so he's not in trouble. So I, just for clarification, once we draft the letter, we'll send it to um, the chair, Commissioner Schwartz, to review uh, um, before we send it off, if everyone's okay with that. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Darren, just want to say thank you uh, for coming today. I know you've had a lot of projects on historic properties in Salem. So you'll, you're, hopefully this is like your last big one. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, we really do appreciate you here. Uh, and we'll get that letter to you guys. Good luck with the process. Thank you. Great. So with that, we are now moving on to the, I'm not going to be able to say this, the Burgraf Webster House Special Assessment Preservation Plan. Great. Okay, cool. So um, this one, I don't think uh, everyone on the commission has participated in one of these. So this is your day for doing things that the commission gets to comment on, but you're not required to comment on. <laughs> so just like the last one uh, that you do, you don't have any regulatory authority, you're just reviewing it. And um, the owner has uh, come tonight, which is great, um, and provided some additional information, which I think Zach forwarded along to you as well, so you can see that. But before I jump into the details, I think it's cool because we were talking about the legislation associated with special assessment, like we've talked about a couple times. And I think that, that all those bills died and we, they're not going anywhere. Um, but um, when they come back, which I'm sure they will, because the the, the law is gonna sunset here, then you'll be really super familiar with it. So uh, the city of Salem, again, which is a certified local government is responsible for re reviewing and commenting on preservation plans that are submitted as part of enrollment in the SHPO administered special assessment program. So this is, this is just for uh, preservation plans that are in our jurisdiction. Of course, we don't review all of them. Um, and 
So the submittal requirements um, for property owners is they have to submit a, a preservation plan that includes projects and the specifics uh, uh, of the projects they have to meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. And I think some of you are familiar with those. Those are really similar to, um, if you look in our code, SRC 230065 are really heavily based on those standards, so quite similar. Uh, and then uh, they have to meet a minimum spending requirement, uh, and then they also have to pay an enrollment fee. So um, getting into the specifics, I just really love this um, building here. Uh, so uh, this was individually listed on the National Register in 1980. It's located at 901 13th Street Southeast and the Burgraf Burt Webster House. Um, it, it was constructed in 1895 by Henry Burgraf. He was an architect and it's a, a significant uh, and exceptional example of a Victorian Queen Anne style cottage. And you should have uh, also received a copy of the preservation plan itself. And there's two projects proposed. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, they're wanting to uh, complete some repairs on the foundation. And they're also wanting to install some insulation, weather stripping and, and vents. And so that, the second project we just initially didn't have very much information on but the owner um, just had a, a, an assessment done today, uh, a bid, and that's, um, so she had a little bit more to share on that. So based upon um, uh, the initial review, it appears that overall the preservation plan appears to meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards. There is one thing I want to point out is that um, anything that um, would normally trigger historic design review here locally would still happen uh, separately from this process. So I just wanted to note that. The only thing I noted was the roof vents. Um, if she proceeds with installing those, they may um, require historic design review, which isn't part of this review, but I just wanted to point that out. And then of course, it appears to meet the mini minimum spending requirements as, as well. So. Just like with the other one, you don't have to take any action at all, or you can direct staff to write a letter of support or just no support or no opposition and just some comments. Um, you're free to do um, whatever you like with this one as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing unless anyone has questions that, okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Kimberly. I see Commissioner French has her hand up. I'm not sure how long that's been up though. Sorry, Jamie. Do you want? Um, I just wanted to state for the record that again, I work at the SHPO office, which is the administrator of the special assessment program, though I am not affiliated with that program in any way and do not review these um, in that capacity. So I can make a fair and unbiased decision here today. Thanks, Commissioner French. Uh, yeah, are there any questions or comments uh, for Kimberly? Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it seems like a pretty straightforward um, application. Um, a very cool house. And yeah, I don't, you know, I know go, it goes through a pretty thorough review uh, from the State Historic Preservation Office where, where they will check for the standards. And as you said, you know, I think we'll, we'll see it if we need to um, as they go through the, the process uh, for, for local review. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kimberly. Oh, I just wanted to point out that the owner's here. Oh, sorry. Would the owner like to add anything? I apologize. <laughs> oh, I'm just here in case you guys had any questions or uh, or wanted clarifications on anything that I wrote in the preservation plan. So um, when we bought, I bought the, the building in 2014 and every year has been a restoration project on it. So I'm, I'm happy to answer anything that you guys um, would want to know. Awesome, thank you for attending. Are there any questions uh, for the, the property owner? I, I had one. Commissioner, Commissioner Ponce. Ponce. Yep, just a question on the um, foundation work that's going to be uh, done. Is it um, necessary to get the archeological um, aspect in that and go through any um, pre-work on that or just be present as we the excavation takes place? 
Uh, well, actually, there won't. The house has a, a full basement. Um, it's dirt, um, and so uh, Cameron Swearingen with MSC Engineering is the one who um, uh, who uh, did the the engineering design for it. Um, they're actually going to run concrete walls inside the brick walls, and so then it will sit um, on the concrete wall foundation. So it's it's going to stay exactly the same. You're not going to notice anything different from the exterior, um, but then it will be supported by concrete walls. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Good catch. Awesome. Well, um, so hearing nothing else, I guess this is the time we get to decide, would we like to write, uh, just say nothing, um, or would we like to write a letter of uh, support or requesting clarification to the State Historic Preservation Office? Commissioner Zimmerman. I'd, I'd move that we write a letter in support. Uh, it's such a unique house. Um, I know when I lived further out and commuted into work more, I used to drive by that place every day. And it was such a unique house and that, that neighborhood, the old U Park area, like that house wasn't too far away from the old U school. I mean, you know, and a lot of those other places have been demolished over the years, but we here we have a, a property owners putting a lot of time, effort and resources into keeping this beautiful place around. So I think we definitely should uh, support those efforts. Is, are, do you wanna make a motion? I do, I, I move to uh, write a letter of support. Awesome, I'll is second. it? Sorry. I'll second. Commissioner Zimmerman moved and Commissioner French uh, seconded to write a letter of support to the State Historic Preservation Office for the Historic Preservation Plan. Uh, Commissioner Zimmerman first and then Commissioner Kurtiman, I do see your hand up. Uh, yeah, just pretty much like what I was saying. It's it's I, I think it's it's commendable that uh, property owner wants to put in the effort to make sure that this uh, gem uh, in Salem is going to be around for a long time for other people to enjoy and uh, uh, appreciate. Awesome. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. Commissioner Kurdeman. So I guess this is more for Kimberly, but um, this uh, if we were to write a letter of support, it's not it's not um, going to change any of our authority when it, if it if this project comes back. Okay, I, I, I didn't know how to word it without it sounding separate. Silly. Yeah, I know. I understand your concern, and Tom's here too. Our uh, sorry, our attorney. Um, but it ha it's a completely different Oregon statute. Uh, we don't have any regulatory authority over this, and this doesn't impact our regulatory authority over historic design. I just wanted to make sure that was clear in my head as well as anyone else who may be questioning. Yeah, no, I mean, so when it's time to do like the roof vents, like, like that, I'll be back, you know, obviously to, that'll get a review, so. Awesome. Well, hopefully you meet our new code where you just get to go through Kimberly, but just in case, we would love to have you back, but uh, yes, Tom. I just, I just wanted to say that uh, Kimberly's right, that this is a separate process and you know, any future decisions uh, are independent from that. Cool, thank you for that clarification and confirmation. Cool. Is there any other discussion on the motion to write a letter of support for the preservation plan? All right, hearing none, um, we will vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? All right, the motion passes. Uh, thank you for coming to the meeting uh, and good luck with all of your your work and hope, hopefully we don't have to see you again, but, but you're always welcome. So oh, you'll probably see me get for another project at some point. So <laughs> that works. That's perfect. So All right. thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so with that, uh, we will move on to our discussion items uh, and we will start with the cultural landscape management plan. Thank you to Robert and Rachel for sitting through the, the business that we had. We're excited to hear about uh, Bush Pasture Park. Great, I'm gonna um, begin sharing my screen here. And so can you guys all see the cover sheet of the slideshow? Yeah, okay. looks great. Okay, great. Um, I guess I wanted to know, if, is, does Patricia wanna provide some opening comments? Just in terms of the city's like, like what's going on with the city, the status of the city right now. I don't hear anything. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to do this on my cell phone. So can you hear me okay? 
Yes. There you okay. are. Um, sorry. Yeah, this is Patricia Farrell. I'm the Parks and Natural Resources Planning Manager. And so uh, we've been working on this project with the team for uh, almost a year now. And the, the goal was really to, to set a vision for uh, Bush's Pasture Park and Deepwood uh, for the future. Um, we get a lot of requests for adding different things to the parks. And we wanted to make sure that the historic and cultural significance is recognized um, in the community. Um, and, so that, and also to find a way to, to uh, have a path forward for the future to make decisions about um, how things should be managed and added uh, to the parks and also to address climate change. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Rachel. Thank you. Great, great. So good evening and thank you so much for having um, our team be part of tonight's agenda. Um, it provides us an opportunity to share the work um, of interest to this commission in the report um, about the management plan for Bush's Pasture Park and Deepwood Estate Gardens. My name is Rachel Edmonds. I'm a landscape architect and a project manager at MIG. We're a firm headquart um, headquartered in Berkeley, but we have a big office in Portland. Um, at that office, much of my professional focus is spent working on projects with a cultural landscape component to them, um, spanning from planning to design to construction. And I work with the National Park Service in both <clears throat> the Pacific West region and the Alaska region, as well as regularly assisting cities, districts, and neighborhoods um, with the preservation of their, of their resources. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Robert to introduce himself and then Paul. Thanks, Rachel. I'm Robert Melnick. I'm a senior uh, cultural landscape expert and preservation planner with, with MIG out of Portland. And uh, my career has really been my entire, my, I would say 95% of my professional career has been working with cultural landscapes um, over the years. I continue to do work all around the country, primarily with the National Park Service but not exclusively. And I think a lot of what you're gonna to see tonight when, when you read the report is driven by got national guidance and national kind of standards that we follow very, very carefully. As, as a, just for note, I did write the 1990 Historic Landscape Report for Deepwood, um, which was my first exposure to the works of Lord and Shriver, Lord and Shriver and, and actually in, in Salem. So with that, I'll, and, let me also say that we are just thrilled to be working on this project. Um, it's been very, very exciting for reasons that we'll talk about as we get into it. And I'll turn it over to Paul. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us here, commissioners. I'm Paula Grimace. I am a principal landscape architect with Greenworks. And I have worked with the city over many years. And Greenworks has worked with the city over many years. And to echo Robert's comments, we're thrilled to be working on this project with you. OK. Um, so why is Salem developing a cultural landscape management plan? You know, Patricia hinted at, at some of, of the reasons, but there's, there's even more. Um, it, this is a significant historic park. It's unique one of a kind site in downtown Salem with a complex layered history spanning indigenous use to white settlement to its current role as a municipal park. Uh, the oak woodlands, its design gardens and riparian area, they're all dynamic features that are continuously evolving and maturing and the management of them needs to reflect that quality. Um, the plan is also needed to address forecasted impacts of climate change and for places all over Oregon, this means longer drier seasons, more frequent and severe storm events, fires and the impact of smoke on the landscape, invasive vegetation and emergent pests. Um, and all this will affect this park landscape in years to come. Uh, an, an important thing to think about is like this plan is supposed to navigate competing priorities that may impact park resources and it needs to strike the right balance between access and protection. Uh, the city has a responsibility to the public to make it an accessible park for people to enjoy from day to day, but it, they also have a responsibility to preserve and protect it for future generations. Um, a framework for an objective decision-making process to evaluate all park proposals is also a, a critical component of the plan. Uh, these and a host of other park management decisions must be in alignment with the park's cultural landscape 
and not, not to mention the Bushes family wishes for the property and this plan honors those wishes. So, you know, we assume you are all quite familiar with the landscape of Bushes Pasture Park and Deepwood. Um, and as you can see from this grid of alternating images of natural features and built and historic built features, the contrast provides a very extremely appealing combination of resources. You know, it has quiet natural spaces that provide refuge, retreat, and reflection. And it also has more design spaces, which encourage gathering and appreciation of architecture and 20th century garden design. Um, and although the district and the parks recognize a period of significant spans 1878 to 1938, there are other periods taken into consideration in the plan that reflect local interest. And lastly, like a fundamental idea of this plan is that to really understand the park's history and how to manage it going forward, you really need a strong grasp of the site's natural history and its ecological history, as everything is part of this larger interconnected system. So the team has developed this draft plan over the past year or so. We started um, with our kickoff, I think last May. Um, and to get you to up to speed where we're at, we're in phase four. We're currently developing the final draft plan. Um, and in doing so, we're meeting with various commissioners and, com and committees to get feedback on select plan elements. So the team's methodology included field documentation and a preliminary horticultural assessment performed in May of June of last year. And over the summer, last summer, we completed a park inventory and assessment of features using, using a nationally recognized system used by National Park Service. Um, we did some repeat photography as shown here to get a sense of how things have changed over time. Uh, we did some research and developed a period plan to create a basis of information needed to begin developing recommendations for the site. Uh, we also did an opportunities and constraints analysis, and that really helped us better understand the range of issues the plan needed to address. Willamette Cultural Resource Associates provided research and assessment of the site's earlier occupation and use by indigenous peoples. Um, this is of particular interest as it relates to the site's natural systems and features, as some of the recommendations the plan makes takes inspiration from the ways indigenous communities manage this land as a thriving oak savanna. And as you can see here on the 1852 General Land Office map, um, the, the expanding kind of core of Salem, early Salem in relation to the future location of the park site outlined in red. The period plan shown here, you know, it depicts how the site, we assume how it appeared in 1938 at the end of the historic um, district's period of significance. And it was developed using a range of, of aerial photography that we found, early site plans and historic photographs. And the kind of the, the takeaways from here is that you can see from this plan, a larger open savanna, wider spaced oaks, and that cluster arrangement of the developed anchors on the Northwest and the Northeast corners of the park. That's today's Bush's House Museum grounds and the Deepwood Estate Gardens. And the period plan for the team was especially useful. It helped inform a range of treatment recommendations and especially as it relates to vegetation densities and natural systems and features. So mapping of the park has not been done as far as we could tell by the city since the late 1960s. Um, at least plans that ended up getting saved in a drawer somewhere or in a file somewhere. Um, the last site plan that we found was from the late 60s. Uh, third, par third parties involved with the park, such as the Mission Street Parks Conservancy has mapped the site more recently. You know, their mission's a little bit different. Um, but of interest to the commission, MIG also developed a rather robust plan appendix that provides an inventory and assessment of all existing park features. 
um, which are categorized using NPS's standard landscape characteristic framework. And these, these tax, tasks were really critical for various reasons. Um, it provides a comprehensive accounting of what the park includes, what it doesn't include, um, the con general condition, some information about their his individual history of these features, and it completes a snapshot of the park as of 2021. Many management recommendations came out of the, this park features study um, and stakeholders in the course of review, you know, they provided feedback for each of these deliverables. So they really encompass like the broadest range of understanding of the park features and it's a task that's never been performed until now. Um, engagement for this site um, included limited yet direct engagement with the tribes the park's various stakeholders and the public was also part of the engagement process. It was kind of necessary to keep people up to speed about what the forthcoming management plan is, what it includes, what it won't include, um, and ways to stay connected. We also got a lot of great feedback from, from people about problematic areas or just issues or concerns they had about the park. And Robert's gonna go over the plan goals. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. I want to first encourage all of you to, if you haven't yet, to download uh, the draft plan. We're, we're obviously doing a cursory review of it, it hitting uh, the highlights, uh, but we encourage you to do that. In order to uh, think more directly about actions that the city can take to, as Rachel said, protect this site, the landscape for use now and into the future for generations, the team, uh, both MIG and Greenworks together and the city developed four large goals that we felt would really support what, what the city wanted and our view of, of how uh, Bush Pasture Park and Deepwood can be protected and preserved into the future. The first of these was to develop an enriching park experience for Salem residents and visitors centered on that cultural landscape. Uh, Bush Pasture Park and Deepwood, are, it's an amazing resource in the middle of a capital city for the state and to really continue to develop that enriching park experience. The second, which is something that I, Rachel just talked about is to build awareness, understanding and appreciation of the significance of the site to the indigenous peoples of the area. This is something that we, we recognize has not been done appropriately in the past and really, really needs to be done. Okay, Rachel, next. The third, is to support and protect the legibility of the historic character of both Bush's Pasture Park and Deepwood Estate Gardens and their context. One of the important factors here is that being a cultural landscape, as Rachel said, it is dynamic, it will change. And the question therefore is what are the essential characteristics of the site that need to be protected into the future and supported? And the fourth one, which goes hand in hand with that, is to enhance the ecological health of the site, including the Oregon White Oaks, the Camas Wildflowers areas, and Pringle Creek. You can't really understand, we can't understand, anyone can't understand the cultural landscape without understanding the ecological systems within which it thrives and exists and continues to prosper. So uh, we, we thought that those four goals really at, at the 30,000 foot level really hit what, what would most benefit the site. And Rachel, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Sure. So um, this figure is the current management areas and the sub areas plan that's color coded and, and it has key numbers. <coughs> Um, there are 14 overall management areas, uh, they, the, the boundaries of which and the number of which were informed by our own consultant process, by the city's feedback, and plan stakeholders at various steps in the process. And the CLMP includes recommendations for each of these 14 areas. And you know, we're gonna spend the remainder of our time tonight highlighting a number of the plan recommendations and their elements of interest to the commission. But before we do that, um, just wanted to also let you guys know that there's some overall management guidelines that were established, five in total. There's one shown here tonight that is more uh, pertinent to this commission. Um, and that, you know, they, they're, they're intended to kind of set the tone and the approach for the area specific recommendations that follow. Um, 
And one of these, this goal here is, you know, it's really reflective of the commission's historic preservation plan goal number four, which is to protect cultural landscapes. Um, and the overall management guideline reads, you know, maintain and protect the historic spatial organization patterns and characters in Bush's pasture park and deepwood estate gardens, including areas defined by their cultural and or natural landscape features, circulation systems, and canopy cover. So with that, we're gonna get into the plan rec area components. Um, so this, you know, the elements for each management area are included here. You know, these elements were identified by the city as things they wanted to include, um, as well as issues that elevated during the plan development. And I'd like to highlight that the graphics you're seeing here tonight are, are kind of pulled directly from the plan. So it just gives you a preview of how the information is conveyed, how the org information is presented. Um, the reason why it is a little more, you know, it's a management plan. So it is certainly day-to-day -day use will be used by city staff, but in general, you know, given that it's a historic site, it's this beloved, gem in the city of Salem, it's going to be of interest to the public. So to some extent, the information, we need to anticipate it being um, reviewed by the public and of interest to the public. And so, um, you know, with that, um, I, I think I also wanted to have Robert talk about the Columbus um, day storm. Yeah, like you, these, they, these they, plan they, elements kind of give you a framework to address issues that will come up down the road that the plan doesn't specifically address in the future. Yeah, one of the things that we've talked about a lot is how you develop goals and a framework of goals and guidelines for how to make decisions. And you can't possibly anticipate every decision that will need to be made. And the example that came up recently in one of our conversations was the Columbus Day storm. And the fact that no one knew that was coming, no one predicted it, and yet it, it, it had a great impact across the Willamette Valley. And understanding that in, if something like that were to happen, having a plan like this will provide guidance for how decisions can be made in the best interest of Bush Pasture Park and Deepwood Estate Garden. So that, that's where that reference came from that. There are often unexpected developments that happen as well as the normal kind of trends. We talk about events and trends. Columbus Day Storm is, is an event, obviously, the changing temperature and changing precipitation patterns are a trend that's happening um, across, across the state and certainly in Salem. But recognizing having a management uh, guidelines to, to address that will be very, very useful and helpful to site managers in the future. Okay, so we're gonna go through a few of the components of each management area that we just wanted to highlight and like let the commission know that touch on issues and areas of interest that um, will are pertinent for you. Um, starting with the Rose Garden, and again, these, these, these are kind of pulled directly from the plan. So the, in general, each spread has a little key map with a thumbnail identifying the management area. And there's various other, you know, all those different categories of things. But the goal here for this area that we thought um, is good to highlight to you guys was that the the idea that you know we're going to try to elevate public awareness of the significance of the different rose beds and linkages to the design of Lord and Scriver and Lord and Scriver is definitely you know pop no well known for their role at Deepwood to some extent their role at um, the Bush grounds near the orchard but they also had their fingers in other parts of the park at different eras outside of the era of significance. Um, Edith Scriver worked on the old Tartar Rose collection layout design. I think she also may have worked um, to some extent on the Willamette University kind of site concept as well later in the 50s. So um, that's one. I'm gonna skip down to the next one. Uh, Robert was gonna go over the orchard. Yeah, the, the orchard is a very important uh, aspect of Lord and Scarver contribution to this, to the site. And, and the goal here is to manage, manage the orchard and the shrub collection uh, as it is consistent with the historic character of Bush House. 
And, I, you know, not, I don't think enough people recognize not only the local statewide, but the national significance of the work that Lord and Scriber did in their time beginning in the 1920s until they both passed away in the 1980s. Um, we, we, it's important to recognize the informal nature that the orchard creates. It creates an opportunity for park visitors to casually walk, walk, stroll, wander through this area and really appreciate that work that they did. We're, we're recommending a, uh, an orchard condition assessment. Even though we think about it as a total orchard, each tree is different. If you understand orchards, especially orchards like this, some trees may be thriving and some trees may be under certain kind of stresses. So it's important to do that. It's also important to consider sending samples of the rare and historic trees to the USDA National Center for Genetic Resource Preservation or some similar laboratory to confirm the presence of those unique cultivars. Um, it, it just, there's a great resource here that the city and therefore all the inhabitants of the city and visitors to the city can really learn from. Gonna unmute myself. So the, the Bush House Museum grounds, um, we also had a goal that uh, kind of reflects interest in, at the commission. Um, it's to preserve the complex diversity of buildings, structures, gardens, and flowers to support an equally diverse set of visitor activities and enjoyment for users of all ages with a careful attention to the interrelationship of forms, materials, and surfaces. And, you know, that's another way of saying that is that every feature, every small scale feature, every uh, design feature on the grounds has something to contribute to the story. So the, you know, the stewardship and the preservation and the rehabilitation of these features together, they combine to create the story. And they all, you know, need a level of attention that is consistent across and throughout. And for an for example, you know, the low stone wall that fronts Mission Street in front of the Bush House, um, you know, that's one of the oldest features that has been along Mission Street, and it's it's still to this day separates the house grounds from Mission Street. Um, you know, it. It's, you know, it could be elevated and visibility could be improved with certain restoration act, acts to, you know, stabilize it, um, you know, do the variety of things that experts who work with dry, uh, mortar set walls can do to kind of keep it and bring it into the next era. Um, next one is the Deepwood Gardens. Yeah, um, David, as we said, is, is, a, is, a, is a critical resource in the city, but also in the state and nationally. And the, the goal here is to preserve that garden as really what we like to say is the magical and enticing landscape that it really is and invite visitors to, to visit it and to be there and to get them to understand the visionary role that Elizabeth Lorne Scriber played in its design and its long-term development. If you don't know, uh, Lord Scriber worked at Deepwood from the 1920s through the 1980s with the Brown family and made changes regularly to that landscape, working with Mrs. Brown and, and her family. And, and that's an important message to send that it wasn't something that was just built and left alone, that they continued to have an impact on that. And, and the primary goal here is to provide high quality gardens that are consistent with their historic character. There are going to be some challenges around, uh, and we'll get to those around the um, the vegetation and 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 some some blight that's happening there that will need to be addressed. But to manage those garden rooms consistent with the Lord and Scriber designs and concepts and processes, um, I like to say that a cultural landscape is a place, but it's also a, a process. It's is it's a noun and it's a verb. It's something that is, but it's something that's also happening. And that's a management opportunity and frankly, a management challenge for the city to address. Um, we we wanna uh, recommend modifications to this historically significant area that, that, and they'll require compliance and formal review by both the state preservation office and the city. And Deepwood requires, as I said, a very, very high level of maintenance to ensure that it that that integrity doesn't get diminished over time. 
I just mentioned the boxwood blight. There's boxwood blight in Salem, and we anticipate that it will be hitting uh, Deepwood at some point. You can't stop that, but you can respond to it. And in the report, there are specific recommendations on how to respond to the boxwood blight, which if, if it were to hit. So we're trying to get ahead of that curve a little bit and plan and plan for that into the future. Yeah, just to clarify, this picture of boxwood blight is not from current right, it's, not, it's, it's not an right. example of what it can look like. Right. I don't want to scare anybody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the feature that Bush's Pasture Park is well iconically known for are these majestic stately oaks. Um, the o upper oak grove is also part of the historic landscape. It's the southward extension of the Bush property. Um, there's stately mature oaks. They create a shady oasis in the park for picnicking and gathering. Um, and the primary management objective here is to ensure it stays that way, um, requiring some changes to, you know, to the intensity of allowable activities and the programming here, which help, will help stabilize oaks um, as we move on. Uh, the city also recognized the need to develop a future policy regarding flexibility around the removal of um, trees in historic areas. Um, that's kind of on the to-do list, I suppose. And it, the aim is really to facilitate priority rehabilitation projects um, to address contemporary needs at the park. Um, an example of this is um, uh, historic clay or er, uh, municipal era clay ground on in the upper oak grove is out of compliance. It doesn't, you know, address safety or accessibility standards. It's a highly desired feature, though, at the park, and um, you know, future renewal of this play area, reimagining of it, is likely going to be challenging given um, oaks and um, everything in the way of this future play area. So it, there may be an assessment where, you know, you can identify oaks that are, you know, potentially, you know, diseased or getting towards the end of their lives. You could prioritize them. There's, there's just kind of needs to be some city guidance around what, what, what flexibility do we have um, around oaks. And another aspect um, that affects the upper oak grove is programs and events that draw large crowds that go off path and uh, kind of trample the root systems, the surface root systems of these trees. Uh, the city has done some work in the, pa in the recent past to kind of start communicating the idea that the Salem Art Fair uh, is likely to migrate to a new spot. And that's kind of a recommendation within the plan as well. And the uh, bush patch you can see on the, the thumbnail on the left, this is a site that this is a, a, a mansion zone that's very closely related to the bush house grounds. And the goal here is to protect it and maintain the open pasture, the adjacent oak trees and the strong historic visual association with, with the bush house grounds. One of the uh, components that we always look at with cultural landscapes and obviously here as well, is what, what did it feel like historically and, and what was the relationship between the natural systems and the built systems? Because they're, they're all part of that comprehensive view of what a cultural landscape is. And that's what this report does. So we got a chart in here. Um, uh, the city expressed a desire during the plan development to create a process for evaluating physical and management actions within the park. You know, the idea is that this process could be used to evaluate a proposal for new art cited in the park um, for that, you know, rehabilitated playground in the upper oak grove. And in general, it's intended to establish an objective process um, to evaluate each proposal using standard criteria to determine compatibility within the district and the cultural landscape. Um, you know, first, you know, you ask the question, does this, does this proposal or action meet standards spelled out in the cultural landscape management plan? You know, next you look at, is it compatible with existing activities? Um, is there adequate funding, you know, to staff it? Um, third, you know, we kind of need at this day and age, you need stakeholders to help facilitate programs and actions at parks. 
Um, is there is there stakeholder interest in participating in this endeavor? And then lastly, does it comply with city standards? And that's kind of where you guys come in. Um, you know, all these proposals, depending on what they are, will go through the right um, level of compliance and channels for review. And that's it. Wanted to give you guys a chance to, you know, if you have, if you reacted to anything in the slides, if something came to a surprise or something came to mind that, hey, you didn't include this, um, we'd love to hear <laughs> some specifics or just get your general kind of reaction on uh, the, how the plan's presented. Or if you have questions and you want more detail now, yeah. we'll be glad to provide that also. Just yeah. And for other areas, areas yeah. of the park. So we have a, could, could somebody um, on the commission kind of navigate the hands up? Yep, I, I got that for you. Uh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. thank you so much uh, to, to Robert and Paul and Rachel and Patricia so much for this. Um, I'm just going to go alphabetically here. So first, uh, Commissioner Zimmerman. I, I wanted to thank uh, everybody on this uh, presentation here. It was really informative for me and I think all of I would imagine everybody who's on the commission has just spent a fair amount of time within Bush Park and have appreciated the uniqueness of the site. I was kind of curious, uh, during the presentation, there was the reference about uh, unforeseen kind of events, kind of like the uh, Columbus Day storm. And while you guys were creating kind of this, this plan and, and, and working through things, uh, how has the ice storm that we had in February kind of being implemented into some of the the work you guys are doing since so many oak trees were damaged or you know forced to be removed from the site especially like in areas 13a and 13b yeah i mean ice storms affect mature trees in some kind of vicious ways like in portland we had similar affected with elms in the south park blocks where trees fell over trees lost major limbs um, and some of those, those injuries are, can be fatal. And you kind of have to understand, you know, what, when you do lose a significant tree in a park, there's a lot to, um, to, to deal with. Like there's kind of public shock. There's, um, you know, how do we safely clean it up? How do we assess the tree for stability? Um, those issues definitely are on our minds. Um, you know, for us, as we were earlier in development of the plan, we were thinking our minds were more around like the impacts of firestorm smoke and what that does and if, how it affects how people can use the park, um, how it affects the, the visual connection between resources when you can't even see down the pasture. Um, so the, all of these the, the, these concerns are are things in our mind. I, I, I guess I would just add to that is that one of the things we're looking at is to get um, a better distribution of age classes of trees. Mm -hmm. um, and so replanting oaks so that we have, we're not just solely dependent on the really ancient ones, but we have young ones growing up as well. Yeah, I wanna uh, chime in on that if I can briefly, that, it, that is that, um, I think Patricia is absolutely right on that, that we, we need to think about longevity and therefore you need a, a range of ages of essentially a range of generations, if you will, of, of the trees, uh, given that every oak tree will at some point find its demise, if you will. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to be depressing about it, but it's true, right? Um, and, and therefore, how do you think about what, what will be replanted and how do you plan for that? So I said, I said earlier, getting ahead of that curve a bit. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Commissioner French. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This is uh, great. Um, I just um, was participating in a similar exercise at our uh, state capital state park. And it's great to have these kinds of updated plants because they were dealing with something very old and um, it's nice to be able to use these kinds of things. Um, I had a question. Did you guys just, do we know when the soapbox derby track was built? It was one of the first features built um, in the municipal era. The date's a little fuzzy, but it's probably 1951 or 52. Okay. Based on what we could find. 
Okay. Yeah. Cause I was, I was kind of looking into it and, um, Oregon has a Oregon heritage traditions. And if there's been soapbox derby races there for 50 years or more, it could yeah. be designated as a heritage tradition. Kimberly, <laughs> 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 But um, there seems to be, I was trying to do some internet searches here real quickly, and that seems to be conflicting, but um, just a future thought. But I, yeah, um, I wasn't, I wasn't able to find a lot about it, um, but I'm sure that there's some things in the, the historic papers, newspapers, that's probably a good way to go. We had a limited scope for historic research, so we kind of used a lot of the documents that were provided to us. Sure, absolutely. And I, I really love the integration too of the um, wild spaces with the historic spaces, especially the use um, by the by the indigenous people um, that call this place home. So um, excellent. And thank you guys so much for presenting here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Friends. Uh, not to jump the alphabet line, but Tom, do you have a question or are we messing something up? <laughs> Uh, I have a question. I can uh, wait my turn. Okay, I will make you wait your turn. I just wanted to make sure we weren't straying into a, a bad area of public mm, meeting law. Uh, Commissioner Kurdeman. Uh, good call, Tracy. I didn't want to deepen that hole if we were <laughs> causing it. Um, yeah, I have a um, just a couple of suggestions, but the I, I like that the replanting of the oaks was mentioned because I feel like the plan was talking about um, you know trying to uh, preserve the oaks that are currently there, but yes, we will have damage to oaks. And I guess I would just recommend that maybe um, using some of the seeds of the oaks that are currently there to replant, I think you might have some better success. Now, of course, if climate change is causing um, a change or need of, of sturdier oaks, then, you know, that can, that can be considered as well. But, um, but thankfully, uh, as long as we keep the, the oaks kind of thick, uh, the, the, the oaks that exist in the center will fare better in storms. If we keep them all spread out, then we're exposing them all to, to storm damage. So, um, so it's, it's good to see that there's, you know, swaths of land that are going to stay oak and not just, here's a pretty oak here and a pretty oak there. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, oh, I was just going to respond that, you yeah. know, the, the, there's a different classes of oaks, you know, there's woodland oaks and there's savanna oaks. Savanna oaks tend to be, they get more sun exposure, so they do grow a wider trunk and they're just shorter and squattier. They, they do have ad adaptations to be more exposed to the elements in that way. So it's good to have a nice mix. Historically, it was more savanna, um, but along the creek, it's definitely more woodland um, typology. And just to yes. add on to that, in addition to collecting seed, which was a great recommendation, we will probably implement that or recommend that for camas and also the fawn lilies, which historically were much more abundant than they currently are. Commissioner Kurdeman, can I interrupt you really quick? I apologize. Um, Commissioner Cottingham has to leave at seven. And since he was on the, he was our representative on this, I just want to give him a quick chance um, to say anything that he might like before he has to exit. And then I will come right back to you. Sorry. Commissioner Cottingham, do you have anything you'd like to, to let us know or questions? <clears throat> uh, thanks. I was kind of preparing for what I was going to say before I raised my hand. So <laughs> that's okay. I work good being put on the spot. Um, no, I would uh, echo, again, appreciation of the work, um, in particular, how the overall management, sort of, a, I know it's the comprehensive management of the, the resources, the park, not necessarily the cultural resources, um, but looking into the, the details around things like um, change, keeping the turf uses, um, but maybe changing the type of turf that's used. And then if you're gonna reduce the impact on oak savannas by continuing to uh, support those sort of natural management systems, um, as well as looking at sort of the long-term view, um, this resource has both sort of natural um, landscape features, as well as of course, all of the design features, um, which also take a really, um, a thoughtful long-term approach. So um, uh, 
yeah, as somebody who really enjoys this park um, and these type of resources, it's it's just reassuring to live in the city and know that there's sort of a, a long-term view for things like gardens, um, which if, if there's nothing in place, we would have to make quick decisions and, and that could be bad. So yeah, I appreciate all the work. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Commissioner Cottingham. And back to you, Commissioner Kurtiman. Thanks, Commissioner Schwartz. Um, I I have some other comments, however, they're more pertaining to particular spots within the plan itself. And so I don't know if it, this is really the place for that sort of thing, or if it would be better to submit those a different way. I think it's fine to submit them. You could submit them to Patricia and then we can review them if they're kind of more specific kind of terminology yeah. or whatever, but if it's a bigger issue, we could discuss it. Okay, yeah, I think I'll hold off then. They're definitely more specific, not as general. So thank you. And I'm very excited. I was very excited for your guys' presentation today. I've been Good. trying to get <laughs> through the plan thank for you. a few weeks now. So I appreciate it. Yes, and you can um, you can either submit your comments directly to me or you could go to the website. And uh, there's a very brief three question survey, which also includes room for comments so for everyone. You. Perfect. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Commissioner Kurtiman. Is that everything? Perfect. Thank you. And sorry about cutting you off earlier. Uh, Commissioner Ponce. Sure. Thank you. Um, again, wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, the question is around Area 6 and 6A. The, we, we, you know, the, the vegetation, the growth, the trees, the shrubs. We have uh, numerous areas where we have that. We have one creek. Um, we have one creek. And that uh, the trail that runs around the backside or the east side of that, um, I think it's a great educational area, and you know it's a, it's a play area as well. But I didn't hear much about any um, reestablishment of the creek or the creek beds. Um, what were you thinking on that? Um, well, yeah, the the Kringle Creek riparian area is um, has a, many pages dedicated to it in the plan. Um, the team was you know, we were aware of a, like the kind of the proliferation of social trails through this area, especially in, along sensitive edges of the creek, um, which um, kind of begins to affect riparian health when, you know, vegetation, when erosion is sort of um, a result of bat foot traffic. So there are recommendations in there about uh, retiring some foot trails, reestablishing a trail on the east side, which would be up to, you know, riparian standards in terms of trail design. Um, this area suffers a lot from invasive vegetation in its understory, which kind of begins to smother out and outcompete um, native plants. So, you know, the, the long-term focus of this area is um, addressing that, that issue. And it's going to, it is going to draw a lot on park resources to do that. It's, it's a very large area. It's probably one of the largest, if not the largest in the park. Um, it's complex just because of the hydrology, um, but there are a number of uh, in kind of types of vegetation that are very vigorous and they are known statewide for being problematic to control. So um, there's a variety of different kind of methods that we outline um, to, to begin exploring how to do it. And one of the things that the park can benefit from is what we'll partnerships with groups like uh, by botany students at uh, Willamette University, who also as a group have a huge stored knowledge of like what this park is. It's sort of their backyard laboratory that those students have used um, for a long time. As far as I can tell, we interacted with um, a couple people from that d department and they are very knowledgeable. I want to add that I, th I think you'll be very happily by, by your comment, Commissioner, very happily surprised by what's in the report mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the, I would say, you know, skimming that we did uh, this evening. Okay, and so I, I would encourage you to take a look at that. We, we, you know, we didn't really want to take eight hours of your time, but we were tempted. Um, so I just think that we wanted to kind of just share with you what we thought was some of the major highlights. Um, so, but on the other hand, when you look at it, we would really welcome comments or suggestions. 
Don't get me wrong, but I think you'll find there's a lot in there that we did not have the time this evening to present. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Commissioner Cottingham, I see you have your, your hand up. Are you still taking off in a couple minutes? You might still be on mute. Muted. Uh, yes, I, I am. And we can have more time to discuss this and I'll also comment on the plan elsewhere. Um, but I was a little bit, I was curious too about the, in the, not in the presentation, but in the plan, um, comments about, I know this is also projecting sort of the framework for future capital investment, which again, I think is great. But as far as uh, city policy around alternative play options, um, is there any, is there more detail on what that would look like? Uh, yeah. Me... I, oh, I was just going to say, Robert, you, go ahead. Well, what, what I was going to say was that you, the, the issue this raises, and I, I'm not going to I'll talk to this generally, is that it's, you know, this is a critically historically important place, but it also has to meet contemporary standards. Uh, when, you know, the Bush House was built or, or Deepwood, there was no such thing as, as ADA requirements, and now there are, just as an example. Okay, so I think that's going to be part of what, what the city will have to address, and we do address that in the, in the report, so... Rachel, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, and in terms of alternative play, I think I think you might be um, hinting at the language we developed around natural play. Um, natural play is um, a very strong force in kind of play and play design and human development. It's it's um, a thing that many cities don't have as part of their park system. Um, it's sort of um, it's something that lots of cities are trying to incorporate and they're finding that it's challenging to meet accessibility standards um, for some of the proposed elements. It's really not, it's really not complicated, but I think there's a perception that, um, you know, it, it can be very rustic and okay, but it still needs to meet accessibility requirements. So people of all ages and abilities can interact with the, the publicly funded feature, um, can, can explore it like anybody around. So um, it's 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 a complicated thing. It's it's one of these um, aspects of landscape architecture that has changed a lot in the last five years. It's sort of moving away from post and platform play equipment and looking at more loose parts, natural materials, things that encourage exploratory play, um, cooperative play. Um, using a range of natural materials. And the setting of Bush's Pasture Park makes it a very appropriate setting for this kind of play. Um, and it, it's something that we wanted to recommend as part of kind of looking forward and trying to think what, what does the city need to nail down to be able to build these kinds of play features. And they tend to be lower visual impact as well, which is good in terms of um, the surrounding park context. And just to add a high level yeah. um, consideration here, as a management plan, we're not getting deeply into recommendations. Um, that will come with future planning that would be at a master plan level. Um, thank you. Uh, Tom. Tom, I think you're, oh, there you I go. Uh, yeah, uh, before I had uh, this assignment, I was the uh, Scrab lawyer, and um, uh, what caught my eye uh, on that last slide was uh, I didn't see Scrab mentioned in the process. Are they part of the stakeholder? Uh, yeah, the group will we'll meet with them in the number of weeks. I can't remember what the date is, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Tom, what is what group is that, Scab? Uh, SPRAB. It's Sprab. the Salem uh, Parks and Recreation, Recreation Advisory Board. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, sure. We're meeting on the 8th of July with them. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> I think I spelled it out like Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory. So instead of saying SPRAB. Okay. So. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Zimmerman. Well, all I was going to do was just uh, comment earlier, Commissioner 
Uh, French asked about the date of the soapbox derby track, and it opened July 12th, 1952. So 52. Oh, okay. we're closing in on the 70 years. I wrote about it a couple of years ago. That's why I knew that one. I'm not that familiar with all of the ins and outs of uh, soapbox derbying, though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our go-to. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. Uh, Commissioner Kurdeman? Yeah, I thought of a, a few other things, obviously. Um, uh, first, I wanted to point out that the plan that you have currently posted on the city's website that you can download, um, it looks like there was an attempt to redact some information. It just says that it's currently being developed. I just wanted to let you guys know that it's not really redacted. Like you can just download it and delete those oh. gray squares and see the text. So I just wanted to let you know that in case you mm -hmm. meant to actually redact it and not have that text out to the public, you might want to change that. Thank you very much. <laughs> the intention was to fully redact it because we're still coordinating with the tribe in terms of their um, approval of it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, oh, you're on. <laughs> and uh, and then the next bit is, uh, uh, you know, I, I've, I've a lot of a lot of the reading I've done of of the the draft and. Everything it was, it's kind of been surrounding around the, the archaeological component of, of the property. So I appreciate, you know, pointing out that any kind of ground disturbance on the property will um, have some sort of an archaeological clearance. And uh, just wanted to emphasize that obviously, you know, this is a high probability area. There hasn't been that much um, formal research opportunities there. Um, you do know that there, you do note that there was, you know, a, a local collector that has documented. Um, or not necessarily documented, but you know, as noted that there's many things that come off the property. Um, but I also just wanted to point out that I know quite a few archeologists in, in the city of Salem that like to walk in Busher's Pasture Park and uh, like to mosey over any kind of hole that <laughs> they find. So I'm just saying uh, not, it'll be hard to not do any archeological work uh, in that area without someone um, calling it out. So uh, I'm glad to see that rather than having some sort of confrontation on the site. Awesome, thank you, Commissioner Kurdeman. Are there any additional uh, comments or questions for, for the group? All right, hearing them, yeah, I, I would just echo exactly what's been said. I think this is um, incredible. I am so glad that the city is committing to this resource. I think especially during the pandemic, many of us probably found parts of this landscape that we didn't know were there. We hadn't explored in the past, just in trying to get out and about. And so it's great to see kind of a holistic approach. And I do really appreciate the effort um, that was made to extend well beyond the period of significance. Um, I think it would have been easy just to say like, these are the years in the National Register nomination and that's what we're sticking to, but that's not telling the entire story. And so I'm so grateful to see that, you know, that we did go back to the indigenous history and, and well into the present day. Um, and then also taking into consideration climate change um, and the, the future really. I, I like that flow chart kind of of management. I think that'll be a really great way to to make sure that we have, you know, Bush Pasture Park for generations to come. I know there is a lot of pressure on this resource. Um, and so I, I'm just thrilled to see this is here. And I know no Commissioner Cottingham had to leave, but you know, thank you for involving us so early and letting us be a partner in this. Um, I, I just think it's wonderful. Um, I know that we have this as a discussion item. However, I would point out uh, to the commission, um, I know we've lost a couple of members, we still have quorum, um, <laughs> that if we wanted to, we could, um, could write a letter of support for the plan. Um, and that would be something that then they'd be able to take forward with them. Um, if, if we made a motion, uh, you know, Kimberly can, can draft that up for us and, and we can do that. If that's something we wanna do, not pressuring anyone to do that. Um, or I get it is something that you know we could could take up at a future meeting um, if we'd like. But uh, with that, uh, I don't know, bug in your ear, uh, Commissioner Kurdeman. Um, I'd like to to make a motion to for the City of Salem staff uh, aid in Landmarks Commission uh, letter of support for this project. Awesome. Is there a second? I'll second it. 
Perfect. So Commissioner Kurtiman moved and Commissioner Zimmerman seconded that uh, the Historic Landmark Commission write a letter of support for the Bush Pasture Park Cultural Landscape Management Plan. Uh, Commissioner Kurtiman, to your motion. Um, I think this is a fantastically done plan. Um, I'm extremely excited about it. I, I would not have minded if eight hours was taken to talk about this. <laughs> okay, sorry um, about that. <laughs> Um, and I, I think it aligns perfectly with uh, our, our own recently um, revised plan as far as uh, taking into consideration cultural landscape management and uh, cultural landscape in general. So I think it's, I think it's a good fit. Um, I've looked over the plan itself and I'm not seeing any huge gaping holes that I feel like the commission would regret later supporting. <laughs> so. Um, I, I see it as a as a as a fantastic project that I think the um, historic landmarks commission it's a it's a winner to uh, to support. So, thank you, Commissioner Kurtiman. Is there any additional discussion on the motion? I would just echo what Commissioner Kurtiman said. I mean, it's it's so great to see just a, a beautifully written, um, elegant, you know, plan that really covers the entire resource and kind of pulls it all together into one place uh, and, and one management resource. I, I would be honored and, and lucky to, to sign that letter that we write. So I'm really, really excited about how the, the city is approaching this, this great landscape. So uh, and we, we had amazing consultants do this. I think it's, uh, you know, I applaud the city for getting such great people on board to write this. Again, I, it, you know, Robert Melnick wrote, wrote the manual on this. So, you know, we're so lucky to, to have his name on this and he gets to, to bring it back from his work in the 90s. So <laughs> uh, <Hey>. awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, all those in favor of the motion to write a letter in support of the Bush Pasture Park Cultural Landscape Management Plan, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. All right, the motion passes. Um, thank you, Paul, Patricia, Rachel, uh, Robert, for coming tonight uh, and sitting through our business and giving us this wonderful presentation. Um, it sounds like if we have any specific comments, we'll submit those either uh, to you, Patricia, maybe through Kimberly, um, or we will submit them online. So thank you guys so much. Great. We really thank, appreciate thank it. Thank you all very, very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Perfect. You guys asked, uh, I just want to say really quick, amazing questions. I was really, really impressed by, by everyone for their, their thoughtful review of that. Uh, with that, I think next we have uh, work plan assignments and check-ins. I think we've lost a good number of our commissioners and we still have quorum, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go down the list. Does anyone have a, an, an update that they'd like to provide? On the, on the survey. <laughs> Yes, perfect. I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, what you already know, Zach is amazing. <laughs> Good. One-handed Zach has uh, completed the survey, and um, I think it, it hits home. It addresses the questions that were posed or um, felt that needed to be posed. So um, when you get a chance to take a look at it, if you haven't already, um, did a great job on that. Great. That's awesome. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce, and thank you, Zach, for, for your hard work on that. Zach, could you send out those questions again? I think I lost them in my inbox. Um, I had just sent them to the people who are going to be on the subcommittee, so I will send them to the full oh. um, commission because I will do that. Perfect. Thanks, dude. Um, okay, and with that, next is news uh, letter assignments, but we're all awesome and have everything turned in. Uh, so uh, unless, Zach, you have a, another topic you want to cover, um, Oh, I nope. I was, I was just going to say everyone's got um, everything in. My goal is um, the only one that I don't have so far is um, Patty was going to write something, but um, uh, due to uh, unexpected um, conflicts, uh, I don't know whether or not she will still be doing that, but we still should have enough content between the three articles that other people wrote and the article about the winners, which will take up a lot of space because there's a lot of pictures. Um, so um, that should be all fine. Um, if anyone wants to think of a theme for the fall edition, um, just uh, shoot me an email or something. Um, otherwise, I will come to you with fall assignments at our next meeting. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. I will ponder themes. Um, OK, last but not least, Historic Preservation Officer Report. Take it away, Kimberly. 
Woohoo. Uh, yeah. So just a handful of things. I know Jamie talked about the road show last time, but they're still doing cool stuff and things. If you haven't checked it out, please do. It's really easy to go see what's going on. Uh, and then this Saturday is Juneteenth. Um, for those of you, I hope you all know already what that is. The, the uh, mayor and council did officially um, acknowledge, and I believe I read that um, President Biden also declared Saturday um, the official um, Juneteenth um, day, which for those of you that don't know, it's, it's honoring the uh, emancipation of the slaves. Um, and there's just gonna be a lot of cool stuff going on and you can access it online as well as in person if you want. And then I wanted to turn it over to Zach to talk about Pride Month, just a, a teeny bit. I know everyone's tired, <laughs> but Zach, go. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know, I also am the president of Salem Capital Pride. So I lead our Pride organization here in Salem. And uh, this will be our 17th year of doing Pride in Salem. It started um, as a very, very small event. I think the first year they got about 30 people um, at a park behind the Walmart on um, commercial. I don't remember the name of that park, but um, that's, um, that's where it began. Um, and for the past few years, we've been holding it at Riverfront Park um, with the exception of last year, obviously. Um, but we plan to return um, this year to Riverfront Park in August. So um, the history of Pride, um, it did start in uh, June um, as um, initially it was a protest at the Stonewall Inn against police vi violence against um, queer people, especially um, queer women of color and trans women of color. Um, um, and it, it's, uh, if you know about the history of Pride, it uh, famously, um, about throwing a brick at Stonewall. Um, so, so that did uh, start initially as a, a sudden protest. Um, and um, since then, uh, I believe we're on the 52nd year of, of that occasion. Um, every June, uh, cities around the world, or around the world, but um, in America have been um, celebrating pride. Uh, both as a way to advocate for equal rights and to celebrate how far we've come so far and, and to push each other forward and lift each other up. So that's, that's kind of just a, a vague history of Pride. Very cool. Thank you, Zach. And, and then in August, you're going to be doing something here in Salem, a little bit more Salem-centric. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm working uh, in conjunction with all of the other Salem's in Oregon, or not Salem's, um, Pride's in Oregon. Um, so I've been, one of our goals is to, to foster a sense of pride in the state um, and not just um, in our each locations and really working together. So um, we wanna try to make sure that none of our events conflict with other people's events um, or at least minimally so that people can travel and, and celebrate pride all across the state. But um, our event, uh, for specifically Salem is going to be in um, in August on, on the third Saturday. We're going to start in the morning with a walk slash run, and we're in the process of determining whether or not we can do something larger after that um, and still be in compliance with whatever public safety um, recommendations are, are still um, going on in August because we want to make sure it's a safe event. Um, as a side note, Kaiser had their first Pride ever um, last weekend on Saturday, wow. um, and I did go to that. It was very exciting. Um, and then Dallas is doing their first Pride event um, as well. Um, I don't know the exact state of that. I talked to their uh, the person organizing that, um, but there, there's lots of Prides popping up. Um, I think there are currently... Um, 17 pride organizations in, in Oregon that I know of, um, but there could be more that I just haven't heard of yet. So, Dallas, that's, that's very surprising. <laughs> very cool. I, I believe they're doing primarily virtual events, but they're doing one in person. Last time I talked to them, they're doing a sort of like photo shoot where someone can come and um, get their makeup done or something and just take some fun pride photos. So. Thank you for sharing that, Zach. That's awesome. And thank you for your work uh, for Salem and on as the, the president of the Salem Capital Pride. That's that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. I am um, actually, oh, now. 
<laughs> I know. Can, don't, we can't have more than three of us there at one time, right, Tom? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, Kimberly and, and Zach, maybe a question. I feel like the Eugene Historic Landmark Commission or the Eugene CLG received a grant uh, to do a historic context statement on the LGBTQ history. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought that was really cool. I, Zach, I don't know if you remember, there was something in the listserv that I forwarded and I was super excited about that. Yeah, Camille, yeah. I wonder if that's something we could um, ask them for a copy of that we could see and maybe even consider doing something like that um, in the future for Salem. It, it you know, mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't have to be our CLG funding, but maybe there's some other resources we could tap to try to start developing that, um, especially yeah. if, you know, the first pride was in, in 2003, maybe that's a great, you know, oral history um, opportunity for some of the people that, that started that. So we can have it, you know, when, when inevitably that, that hits the national register criteria, I'd be curious to, to see where we can go with, with that as well. Yeah. They received a, um, uh, an award, a preservation award for that work that they did. Oh, yeah, and didn't cool. the University of Oregon, I want to say like Lesbian Oral History Project received the Oregon Heritage Excellence Award this year. So yep. awesome. That's so great. Great. Yeah, perfect. Um, well, is there any other items? Are you are you done with your officer report, Kimberly? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. sorry. I was like, did I cut her off? Um, are there any <laughs> other items uh, that we need to discuss? Kimberly, I look forward to the nomination to the um, Oregon for Heritage the Edition for the soapbox jury. <laughs> Andy's going to help with that. <laughs> I yeah, think if next day, year's the 70th, great. that's a great, great time. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Great idea. <laughs> um, yeah, Commissioner French. I forgot. I had one other thing, but I forgot. Go ahead. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, I'm going to adjourn. So are you sure you want me to go ahead? Kurtiman. Oh, no, Commissioner Kurtiman, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, to make sure, especially with Tom, that um, so the I, I looked at the website for submitting comments for the plan for the landscape management plan, and they don't really have like a, a comment submittal. You just you just kind of email them. Um, they have a survey, but it's like two questions and then you're done. There's not really. Oh, you can just send your comments through me and I can get them to Patricia. I think that's fine. If you feel that's like, if you want to write on the plan, I mean. Okay. Well, I was just, I was just curious if, if I needed to, to do it more as a um, public person, not a commissioner. You are allowed to do it as a commissioner. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's fine. Thanks. It's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I did have one thing, sorry. And this will give Jamie more time to think. And I can't remember if we talked about this um, while everyone was here. So it's looking like potentially we might open back up in July. Uh, and so our next meeting, we're looking at having a public hearing. As soon as we know information, we'll let you know. So if you don't hear anything, we'll just keep uh, meeting virtually, but just letting you know what we're hearing. Would there Thank be you, a really? virtual component for those of us that might perhaps be traveling that day? Uh, oh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Zach? We were thinking that actually that's something we might even be required to do. I haven't heard anything recently, but the legislature was looking at passing some legislation, making sure that local jurisdictions offer people the opportunity to provide public input virtually. So which would mean we would have to have our technology working, um, which I want to say is easy. We've all figured it out, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you can just I, bring a laptop and set it there. And that and put it in you where you would sit, right? Yeah. And that's Jane. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would imagine that what will happen is that um, the city council will be the first board to or right. uh, body mm -hmm. to return to the chambers. Um, they have the, the most support, um, so they'll figure it out and then pass on, um, all their technological improvements to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would be surprised if our next one is in person, but maybe then one after that, I don't know. Yeah. Right now we're looking at hearings in both July and August. So we're going to, you're going to have to remember, well, you guys do a great job anyway, so it won't be hard to get back on track with that. So. 
I excuse you for that meeting, Commissioner French, because I not even I can't imagine looking at real hands and these computer hands. I still forget <laughs> to open this little participant list. So I was gonna say what's gonna happen is someone's gonna mute me at the start of it on my little laptop screen. <laughs> I'm just gonna be quiet the whole time. You're done. But no, we'll project you on the big screen right there no. at the front. No, 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 Oh, no. Awesome. Are there any other items uh, for discussion? Perfect. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of you. Um, again, the questions we asked for that uh, cultural resource management plan, I was incredibly impressed by. So thank you guys always for your engagement. Uh, if there are no more items, we will adjourn. All right. Thank you guys for a great